Eminem from Sahara TV. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolph Okonko. You are in the round table. And I have a special guest here with me, Dr. Wumi Akintide. Dr. Wumi, welcome to Sahara TV. Yes, to for having me. Wumi is a columnist for NigeriaWatch.com and a contributor to our show. And we're always happy when we see you. It's been a while that we, we've been here. And uh, I want to ask you so many things have been going on in the country since you last came here. Um, We've dealt with the 67 billion that was missing from our uh, foreign reserve. And we seem to have moved on to other things. Why do we behave that way without holding anybody accountable, without resolving one issue we moved on? And well, I think it's the same story. You know, we've had this kind of allegations before. And uh, because there are two people to be blamed, we have the press and the news media. If they are doing it, they are actively doing their work and they are proactive. They are the people who continue to press on this matter until the government has a reason to address it. The second point is that the people themselves should talk about this thing. I mean, a country with all the suffering going on, and for that kind of money to be wasted and nobody does anything about it, is uh, it's really absurd, it's a travesty. But um, for example, take America for instance. Um, I saw a documentary, maybe you saw it a few days ago, um, Hubris, Selling the War on Iraq. That was actually aired on MSNBC, and it was moderated by Rachel Maddow. That was, uh, the documentary was to show that America went to war. Bush and Cheney went to Iraq war, looking for I mean, telling people, convincing America that they were going to find nuclear weapons. And they went there and found nothing. Now, Maddo and MSNBC and the liberal press would not let this matter go. And they continue to harp on it. Harp on it until the people who are involved in that decision will be made to really feel sorry for the decision they have made. And the, most of them have now come out and said, well, it was a mistake. How could you come with such a mistake? Such a terrible mistake that... Uh, cost a lot of money, and uh, both in debt, both in blood and everything. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is that uh, our press and the media should be more proactive. And then the people themselves should pursue this thing and continue to harp on it until it will prick the conscience of the people in government oh, to do which, something about which it. Which press are you talking about? Because I'm confused. Nigerian is press. it the Nigerian press that is in the pocket of the politicians? Where do you, where, how would that happen? Yes, OK, well. The Niger it's true, you said the Nigerian press, most of them are in the pocket of uh, the government because the government has the money to pay them and to bribe them so that even those of them that are very, very vocal and uh, want to speak the truth, they will be silenced. It's unfortunate, but yet there are still a few individuals that are good that will continue. For example, out of all this confusion that is happening, look at Sahara, Sahara TV. If you are in Nigeria now, I know you will not have been able to perform the way you are performing now because you would have been silenced, but because you are abroad. But the mere fact that you have a group of Nigerians, two dedicated Nigerians, who devoted their life in spite of all the difficulties and all the problems they have to confront, to really put a satellite on what is wrong with Nigeria and let people know, I think it's commendable. Back home, we still have people like that. They are not, they are not as many. But we still have a few who cannot be bought with money. I am talking about such people that if such press, uh, media, are more focused and they continue to harp on this thing, that the government will be forced to do something about it. Now, uh, let's move on to uh, more current uh, issues. Um, the opposition party, mm -hmm. they formed what they call the All Progressive, Progressive. Congress. Yes and they hope to challenge the PDP. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Is there any chance that they, they really can carry it on until the election and, and 
make any change? Okay, uh, that's a very, very good question, but we've been there before. The opposition have tried to really gang up or unite to fight the main cabal that is ruling Nigeria. But it has always failed. And uh, even though they are promising everything, that this one is not going to fail, but the government has a way to really infiltrate them, buy some of them, and some of them will be fighting on the issue of uh, position, who is going to lead the party, which will be the presidential candidate, and all of that. We are not matured enough to make sure that we don't allow such things to polarize the uh, uh, evolving consensus. So I believe that what happened to the last effort to really dislodge the PDP is going to happen again, unless uh, uh, I'm not too optimistic that uh, these people can survive because once the federal government uh, gets into them, infiltrate their ranks and fire and bribe and take away some of them, you see that the whole thing is going to flounder. Mm. I will be pleasantly surprised if they are able to do what they are promising. And if they are able to do that and they are serious about it, they have a great chance of dislodging the PDP. Because the PDP as it is now has failed the country. The PDP government has, uh, has failed the country. And in a two-party system, when you try one party, if it doesn't do well, then you have an opportunity to try the second one. And look at America that we're talking about now. We have two major political parties, the Republican and the Democrats. If the Democrats fumble, then the nation will turn to the Republicans. If the Republicans fumble, then the nation will also turn to the Democrats. Right now, the Democrats are doing pretty good, and the Republicans are in disarray. And they may well continue to be in disarray for the next uh, four, eight years. But sooner or later, they are going to get themselves together, and they are going to find a candidate that can rebrand the party. Rebrand the party, not just their message. They are going to look at the messenger and the message, and be sure that they are doing things that uh, the voters can accept, and over time, another Republican will become president again. That is the way it's supposed to be. But in our own country, it's this PDP. Uh, all that they do is either change their name. It went from uh, MPC, from MPC it became MPN, from MPN it became... Uh, you mean this is the same party? Same people, <laughs> same people all the time. NC, N, N, R, N, NRC, NRC, NRC yeah. the same party? The same people, PDP. How those. do they know themselves? How do they come together and say, this is our party now? Because when Babangida came, he, he formed two parties yes. and said, OK, you join either SDP or join NRC. So how do they, do you know where to join? Oh, well, you know Babangida, when I think about Ibrahim Babangida, I was in government. For you 20, were part I, of the I was, Yes, I was in government, the federal government for more than 25 years. And uh, in fact, I was uh, secretary to the National uh, Nigerian Commission, Trade Commission, with the rest of the world. So I knew precisely what happened. I think Babangida would have been one of our greatest president if he had stuck to his program. What he was trying to do was to reduce the parties to just two, two major political parties, NRC, NRC and SDP, with uh, Abiola leading one and uh, Tofa. Presenting, I mean, uh, leading the other party. It would have been the greatest thing for Nigeria, but that man chickened out of it because of greed. I and mean, he changed his mind. He was the one who set up that thing. If he had allowed the thing to work, Nigeria would have been different today. And uh, that's why I'm saying that uh, where you have two major political parties, one party is in government. If it does not perform, you have an opportunity to go to another party. But we don't have such luxury in Nigeria, and that's why we have problems. Now, let, let's go to uh, other issues that are, that are taking place. Um, this, this week also we heard that um, the, uh, Jonathan, the president, yes. during the time of the transition from Yeradua, right. that he signed an agreement with some governors of the PDP that he will run for only one single term. Yes. And now it seems, you know, the, the signs that he wants to run again. And the governors are kicking and saying that, no, no, this is not what you signed for. You signed that you shouldn't run the second time. What, what do you think about that? Well, I wasn't there, but we read in the newspapers at that time that because there was some very powerful group in the north, in the party, in the PDP, that they did not want uh, Jonathan to even succeed Yaradwa. And Jonathan 
felt that it was his turn. He was vice president, and the Constitution supported him. If uh, the, for any reason the president dies in office, automatically the vice president should step in. So Jonathan, in order to be able to bring all these people to agree with him, probably signed the agreement. I, I won't be surprised if he did sign the agreement that, OK, I will only serve for one term. But as soon as he, he got what he wanted, he started uh, changing his mind. And he started talking and saying that, uh, well, uh, the Constitution allows for at least two terms. The one that I served before was uh, the remainder of a uh, year I do or something. Now I have an opportunity, so this is my first time. So I'm not at all surprised that uh, such would happen because power, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That is what is happening in Nigeria. Once you get power in your hand, you don't want to relinquish it. And that's what the problem we're having right now. So should, should, should we be concerned about the internal politics of, of PDP? Shouldn't the nation be concerned about whether this candidate is performing or whether we have a better candidate that could perform better than the president? Is that not what should we be concerned about? I think you place your finger right on it. I mean, we should be concerned about whether Jonathan has performed, has done what he was required to do, has actually moved the country forward. But that's not what they are saying. They are not, nobody is judging him on performance. Everything, every index of progress, if we check it in Nigeria, where it's uh, uh, one step forward, two steps backward, all the time. And right now, the even national security of the country is in shambles. You, with all this uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, the Boko Haram and all this. So there are problems galore. I, uh, Jonathan does not deserve to have a second term. Uh, we're not going to be on sentiment. If he has performed, yes, I'll be one of the people rooting for him. But he has not. I mean, look at America now. We have the first black president ever in Obama. Obama is, is able to get a second term because he has performed. People have seen results from what he was doing. And that was why the whole nation, and he saw most of the issues that should determine the outcome of the election. Obama was on that side. And he managed to really drive the Republicans to the other side. And that's why the Republicans lost the election, and he won. Two days ago, Patience Jonathan, the wife of the president, said that 100 opposition parties cannot stop the PDP. And based on what happened this week, we now pay special attention to what she says, because she's no longer a regular guy. She said she went to Germany, she died for seven days, and resurrected. So are you concerned that about the whole story of the journey of Patience Jonathan to Germany, uh, the denial of any kind of hospitalization when that was happening, and the fact that today we now know that she went through nine surgeries and she died. And w what do you think if you were in, in the place of Ruben Abati that came out and said, this was all wrong. This was all not true. She wasn't sick. She was, and now she came out to say, I was sick. I was almost dead. How, what would they do if you were in his position? Well, um, I once wrote an article when uh, Rufus, I mean, Ruben Abati was first uh, made the presidential advisor yeah, so to right. Jonathan. Yeah. And I wrote saying that um, Ruben was a good uh, journalist, was a good reporter before joining the administration. But I wasn't too sure whether he was going to remain the same once he eats out of the forbidden food. He has eaten out of the forbidden food, so Ruben Abati is a different Ruben Abati now. So he, the virus, it's, it's called the virus, it's called the bug. And so I'm not surprised about that. But with um, the first lady saying that 100 parties cannot destroy the PDP, well, he knows what he's talking about. Because the federal government controls the funding, the money, all the money, all the, the, the revenues coming to the federal government. You see, the husband is in charge. And uh, as a matter of fact, most of the states that are created now, they cannot survive by themselves unless they get some uh, subventions from the federal government. Therefore, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So he knew that money is going to be the root of all evils. And when it is time, 
the federal government is going to deploy money, is going to use money to woo some of the people there to destabilize the all progressive uh, Congress and make them into uh, drive them into disarray so that nothing nothing will work. So the president's wife was uh, was right to say that. Now, but talking about the, the uh, uh, patient, Jonathan said that he resurrected. I mean, uh, he went to Germany and all the lies that was told to the nation. Uh, it, uh, it's ludicrous. It makes me want to laugh, really, because even Jesus Christ, uh, <laughs> it took three days for him to, ri for, to rise from the dead. But uh, our first lady said uh, she, died, she died for seven days and rose from the dead. That was all bunkum. That was all nonsense. But in Nigeria, such things sell. I mean, some people buy such nonsense. Um, I feel so depressed about that situation. And, uh, and uh, it's a very sad commentary on the position of our president himself, that his wife will be talking such nonsense and he will not be in a position to really put him in order, I mean, put her in order and call her to order. Talking about the president, when we now know, which is something that was revealed this week on Sahara Reporters, that when he was the governor of Bielsa State, he gave $1 million from the Poverty Alleviation Fund of the state to the publisher of this day, Ndoka Obiewena, to, to bring Beyonce to, Amer to Nigeria to basically come and sing the national anthem for Nigerians, $1 million. Um, this is money that was budgeted for poverty alleviation in, in, in the state. How does that make you feel? And what does that tell you about the character of the person we now have as the president, a person that is supposed to manage the resources of our country? It just makes me feel what I've, um, the opinion of I've always heard that um, Jonathan was a very weak president and uh, that he is very corrupt too because um, I mean, why use the money that was used, that was supposed to be used to reduce poverty? And then you give one million out of that money to go Beyonce, who is already a multimillionaire, only to come to Nigeria and sing uh, the Nigerian anthem her own way. It was a, mi a misplacement of priority. And um, it was very, very unfortunate. And that's one of the sad uh, stories of Nigeria. But, but, you know, we just say it here and, and we let it go. What should the Nigerian people who are watching at home, what should they ask for? What should they demand for? When do we go beyond talking about issues to demanding for accountability? Do we even have that concept in Nigeria where people are held accountable for certain things that they did? Yes. I think we do have um, this concept of accountability, but the problem is that there is very little, we, we don't have an organized kind of response to some of the evils that are taking place in our country. But that is not to say, for instance, we just did a program here, and I hear people calling from Russia, calling from all over the world. They are concerned about it, but we need more than that. We need something to be really organized and to be persistent so that we just don't demonstrate and then give it up. I, I remember, I remember way back, this was uh, 19, early 1960, 1960, when uh, Balewa was still prime minister of uh, uh, the new, uh, newly independent uh, country, Nigeria. Balewa government was going to sign a, a British, I mean, a defense pact with Britain so that uh, Britain and Nigeria, Britain would defend Nigeria in the event of any war or any attack and so on. You know it was the student union, I was at the, uni uh, the university at that time, it was the student union from the University of Ibadan, the few universities that were there at that time that shut the program down. And they went massively, trooped out, demonstrated and did everything until the matter was actually shared by the government. That, that's, I, know that, I know that story. Now, the question is this. If someone is watching and they are from Bielsa, right. and they now know that $1 million from their money was given to this American musician to come and sing the national anthem by their own gov governor, yes. what do you want them to do? What oh, do you tell them they the, can do? Because most people, are, they are helpless. They, don't, they can't think of what they can do to to deal with the situation, to get back their money? There are lots of things they can do. They can go on the street, demonstrate, complain, and do all of that. But 
like I said, money is the root of all evils. All those people that were, the government will use the SSS the people to infiltrate them and find out who are the leaders of uh, the group and then uh, uh, give them money. And once they give them money and they, have, they satisfy them, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. So it's all because of this corruption, which is, so, which is such a big cancer in our country. It has, it has destroyed the country. Now, what about Nigerians abroad? Yes. Okay, because we can say this about Nigerians at home. Okay. Maybe because of hardship and poverty, people yes. tend to be easily bribed. Yes. What can Nigerians abroad do to, to be able to demand for accountability and transparency from politicians at home? That question, that, that, uh, the, the, the answer to that question is this way. It's precisely what your television station is doing right now. Sahara Television. Even though you are the only one doing it, is that kind of you are organizing the people. You are trying to let the people know the truth, because if if the people know the truth, they will be liberated. And uh, once they said uh, information is true for decision making, unless these people are given information, and then they will be able to react and do things. Now you are talking about people in diaspora. The people in diaspora too. Many of us who left home to come here. We left home in pursuit of uh, the green pastures. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes we have things we couldn't do at home. That uh, some of us who, have, I mean, look at you, uh, you are an engineer by profession, but so multi-talented, you could have done, you could have been anything you want to, but you are much, very much interested in the arts, and that's the, that's the kind of thing you want to do, and you want to be free to make a choice for yourself. So you came here. And when you come here, it's not easy to really go back and uh, start throwing stones back at home. And some of us will try, like you are doing, because I think uh, Sahara Television is making an impact that the government itself feels. And I'm sure I won't be surprised if the government is not already trying to find a way to appease uh, uh, those of you who make up this organization to make sure that uh, you are reduced to nothing. I remember when uh, uh, um, Dr. C, the IT, uh, uh, AIT, AIT man, he was trying to do something like that and so on, but because the government, the government knew that it was going to uh, make things difficult for them, they found a way to sabotage him. Uh, he's still there now, but it's not as uh, the way it was supposed to be was not what it, it's not what it is today. And that's because the government is always there to sabotage their effort. This is the problem that uh, even people in diaspora, Nigerians in diaspora face. We know that we have problems. We know how to really begin to tackle the problems, but where the means are not there. All right. We have uh, just one minute left. Um, let me ask you, um, the governor of Washington State is touring America. And, um, we may have him on the show here in the next uh, two hours. If you are going to um, ask him a question, what kind of question will you ask him uh, about the state of things in Ocean State? Um, I, you know, I come from Ondo State. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm much more concerned about Ondo State, and I'm much more familiar with what is going on in Ondo, Ondo state, state than Ocean State. Okay. I know today that the Mimiko is doing his uh, inaugura inauguration, yeah. inauguration, and they are celebrating all of that. Um, w w the question I would have liked to ask uh, uh, Alec Bechola, because I know Alec Bechola was very, very prominent in the ACN. And uh, ACN was making effort to make sure that the whole of the Southwest get together, form an economic union, which is a good idea. But the point is that ACN has to prove that they have what it takes to do what Awolowo did in those days. If um, some of the allegations we are hearing about ACN, the governance and the various states controlled by ACN, if they are true, then I will be surprised if by the next election they will still have what, as many can states you, as What well. allegations are you hearing? Just briefly. Well, corruption, too. I mean, the way they are spending government money. And uh, for example, I bet you it's here now, touring the world. I don't know, he might have come for trade or to, to sign some. Uh, of course, it's always trade or something. Right, they have to. That's the reason. Uh -huh. And when they're, when they're here, 
Later, after they leave, if we hear that uh, they are doing money laundering and all of that, just like happened to the other people. We actually, there. incidentally, this week we also saw uh, the charges against Peter Odele, how he spent uh, over $500 million. Right. And most of them were money sent out yes. that people are going abroad, are going government officials are exactly. going abroad. Exactly, Esther code and yeah. all of that, and they, they paid themselves double the amount and so on. Most of all these things will come out, but sometimes they come out too late, after the fact. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Alec Bajala looks like um, somebody serious, I mean, from what I read about him, but um, I think the taste of the pudding is in the eating. We'll find out. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for coming on Sahara TV. Thank you. Nice uh, having me. That's uh, Dr. Wumi Akin today, and uh, we went through several issues about Nigeria, and uh, we hope you keep joining us because we have more programming coming to you. We have, uh, we're going to talk about immigration in, in America, uh, about the new immigration law, and we have an uh, immigration attorney from D.C. joining us, uh, Mkwacha. We also have uh, Keeping It Real with Adela and uh, Dr. Damages. And every other uh, shows that we we are going to bring to you. So stay tuned and keep watching. Uh, thank you. <laughs>